So right now I'd like to welcome Dr. Jason Fung, a nephrologist from Toronto, who's come all this way. Many of you may have heard of him. Um, Jason's written a couple of books, and he's one of the people that really made the idea of fasting or intermittent fasting kind of uh, popular. So Jason, welcome to the stage. So, the world's oldest dietary intervention, one that's really been used for millennia, in all generations, in all civilizations, in all parts of the world, endorsed by really all major religions, which is free, which is available, also has the power to reverse type 2 diabetes. But, not only do we not talk about it, Generally, as a physician, we're told to actively discourage this, which is very interesting because I'm going to tell you a story. This is my patient, and he was a 69-year-old man, and I treated him for 15 years almost. Type 2 diabetes, he was on metformin, he was on 160 units of insulin. And so as I learned about intermittent fasting, I said to him one day, I said, you know, Maybe you should try this. For three days of the week, just eat one meal a day instead of three. All right? So he, he was very diligent. He did it. And this is what happened. So his insulin dose went from 160 units a day in about a month to zero. And his body weight came down, and his waist circumference came down, and his A1C actually dropped from 7.8 to 7.2. So after about another month, his actually, actually he came off all his medications. His A1C was down to 5.9. So by definition, he actually didn't have diabetes anymore. And the problem was that for 15 years, I failed him. I didn't know enough to actually tell him what the proper treatment was. He didn't actually need to have the type 2 diabetes for 15 years. And that's my shame. That's my problem. And that's what we're here to change, to talk about this. And intermittent fasting is not very difficult. They understood a long time ago. Basically, it's energy, right? And if you have, say, a coal-burning power plant, for example, you have energy in the form of coal. We use energy in the form of food. And when you take in food, you can either burn it or you can store it. And there are ways that the body stores energy or calories, which is sugar like glycogen. You get glycogen synthesis. And you can store it as body fat, which is de novo lipogenesis. But you know, dietary fat goes directly in. So the whole idea is that if your insulin levels are high, we know from sort of 50, 60 years of research that it inhibits lipolysis. You can't take the stored energy if your insulin levels are high. So that fellow who's taking 160 units of insulin a day, which I gave him, he can't take body fat out and turn it into energy. Because remember, insulin is nothing more or less than you know, a nutrient sensor. It tells your body, hey, food is available. So you can burn some of it, but you need to store it. But don't take what's stored out. We're trying to put it into storage, so don't take it out of storage. That's all it's telling you. And you can't take it out. So if you have too much glucose, if you have too much body fat, as long as your insulin levels are high, you can't take it out. It's only when insulin drops, such as with fasting, such as with low-carbohydrate diets, for example, that your body says, OK, well, no food is coming in. So I am going to need to take what I have stored you know, in this warehouse and use it. That's all. So in other words, you need to give your body a chance to drop that insulin level so that you can burn the glucose and burn the body fat. And that's really what you're supposed to do. That's why you have the English word break fast. Because every day, you're supposed to finish eating and fast. So there's a period of time that you're supposed to eat. Insulin goes up. You store energy or calories. There's a period of time you're supposed to not eat, which is fast. Insulin goes down. You now use that energy. 
you don't keep it building up and up and up, which is the big problem. And so recently, there's been some trials. And unfortunately, it's taken until sort of 2022. But they're starting to come around. So this is an inter intervention trial in type 2 diabetes, where they basically told people for three months, plus three months follow-up, to do some intermittent fasting. And what you see is that in the placebo group, you had a 2.8% remission rate. In the fasting group, you had a 47.2% remission rate. Almost 50% of our patients don't need to have that diabetes. But it's because we don't tell them that they should do this. And it's nothing more or less than give your body a break and let it burn off all that energy that you've stored away. Because that's the natural thing to do. If you've stored too much, you need to burn it off. You don't need to take more. You don't need to eat six or eight or 10 times a day like I had been telling people to do. It's ridiculous. It's the wrong thing to do. And now we have trials that actually say, hey, you know what? That's probably not such a bad idea. This is a much smaller trial, but again, very recent. This uh, came out, I think, in 2022. And it's the same thing. It's called the Interfast trial. And again, a randomized controlled trial on the safety and efficacy. So safety, we actually have thousands of years of data. People have been fasting for thousands of years, so we're pretty sure it's, it's relatively safe if you have enough stores of energy, that is body fat or glucose. And what they found was that you could get remission in eight patients. This was a small study versus zero patients in the placebo group. Again, a very important result because these patients don't have to have type 2 diabetes. And of course, you, you look at this Interfast 2 trial and you see you know, the A1C changes are, are, are plummeting in the fasting group, which is sort of exactly what you would expect to see. If you look at the number of people getting reductions of insulin, you know, 75% of people are going to reduce their insulin needs. Well, that's just logical, right? If you have a car, and you go to the gas station and you fill up three times a day, and you're pumping gas in, now the gas tank is full. But your doctor says, keep pumping. So you keep pumping, and the gas is flowing out into the back seat. You're getting sick. Well, what's the first thing you're going to do? Stop going to the gas station. That's all an intermittent fasting is doing. It's so bloody logical. I don't know why we don't talk about it. But when we do. <laughs> The results are just stunning, like unbelievable results to you know, me 10 years ago before I actually learned about it. Uh, this is another trial, again, 2022. So we've just recently been starting to talk about this, another randomized controlled trial. And again, what you see is in here the intermittent time-restricted eating, which is the intermittent fasting group, again, a significantly lower level of uh, glucose. So I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to just talk about the physiology, because it's, it's been worked out for, again, 50, 60, 70 years. What happens when you don't eat? And this was the classic study, and it basically shows you where blood glucose comes from. It tells you, it breaks it into sort of five stages of fasting. In stage one, you're eating, so you're getting exogenous glucose, which is, you know, you're eating food. Your body is saying, OK, I'm going to use the energy that I'm using. That's great. When about four or five hours afterwards, there's no more food, so then you break down glycogen. So glycogen is just a long string of glucose. It's in the liver. Your body then takes that glucose, chops it up, throws it back into the system for you to use as energy. At some point around 12 to 16 hours, you see there's a bit of a change. Glycose starts to, uh, glycogen starts to run out. And you get this period of gluconeogenesis where you're using a bit of protein. And that's not necessarily muscle. There's a lot of excess protein in people who are overweight. It's estimated about 50% uh, of, of the uh, obese people have about 50% more uh, protein. That includes connective tissue and skin and all this sort of stuff. But then after a certain period of time, the gluconeogenesis starts to go down, and you basically power yourself on body fat. Again, pretty logical. Your body stores energy as glucose and fat. 
When you don't have food, your body uses the glucose and fat, and that's all it is. That's all body fat is, is a store of energy. So let your body use it. Instead, we try and come up with all these complicated things and say, why are we getting too much? Well, you put too much in storage because you told your body through high insulin levels to store more. So your body stores more. People talk about causality of obesity. Well, if you have something which causes another thing, you just say, OK, if I give this thing, does it cause Obesity. If I give insulin to people, does it cause obesity? Absolutely. We've known that for hundreds of years. Every single patient of mine tells me that. And yet we still argue about what causes obesity. Well, I'll tell you what causes obesity. Insulin. I give insulin, they get fat. I can make anybody fat. I can make Ben Bickman fat. I can just <laughs> give him insulin, and he will get fat. So that's causality. Don't make it more complicated. It's basically fasting is a way to switch from using all your glucose to using fat, because that's the way your body stores it. When you don't eat, other hormones go up. Again, medical school physiology 101, you have counter-regulatory hormones. Sympathetic nervous system goes up, adrenaline goes up, growth hormone goes up, cortisol goes up. Again, they take the, because you're not having glucose, exogenous glucose, your body's sort of pushing it out. So what happens over time with the metabolic changes, this is four days of fasting. As the body weight comes down, the resting energy expenditure, that's how many calories you're burning in a day. On day zero, is 39.7. Day four of no food, it's up to 44. So your body has increased its energy expenditure by 10%, even while it's not eating. Why? Because the hormones told it to. The noradrenaline went up, growth hormone went up. It says, push more glucose into the system. And that's basically what it does. Growth hormone, after five days of fasting, goes up like fivefold. We've known that. This was a study from 1988. Not that difficult. And for you know, this intervention that we've used for thousands of years, there's so many advantages. It's simple. You could just tell people, just don't eat for this period of time. Calorie restriction is not the easiest thing. You have a piece of salmon. It's like, well, did you cook it in butter? What did you add to it? Did you marinate it? Like, it's, it's very difficult to figure out how many calories are in that piece of salmon. It's very easy to say, I did not eat from you know, 6 PM till 6 AM. And if I want to say, oh, just go longer, you can. And people, sometimes people say to me, oh, well, people won't do it. It's a great intervention, but people won't do it. And I always respond, well, my job as a doctor is not to tell people what they can and cannot do. My job is to tell them how they're going to get healthier. If we give people chemotherapy and give them all kinds of crazy surgery, they'll do it. And you're telling me they won't just not eat for a little while to reverse their type 2 diabetes, to prevent cancer, prevent heart disease, and all those other things? You can use any diet. So low carbohydrate diets are great, but you don't have to use it. I think it works well together. But you can use it with any diet. In fact, it has been used with every other diet. It, all over the world, in all times in history, it's free. So GLP-1s are great. They're not cheap. This is free. And it's convenient. You can do it whenever you want. You can. You know, uh, if you don't eat, you don't, have to, you don't have to shop, you don't have to cook, and you don't have to clean up. So you're saving a lot of time. So it's very convenient, and it's flexible. That is, this is the way people used to do it. You're not fasting all the time. You're not feeding all the time. If you have a period of time, like Christmas or a holiday, you go on a cruise, yes, you are going to eat too much. I do it. Everybody does it. The point is that I don't have to fast while I'm on my cruise. I don't have to be that guy who won't eat that. And it's like, oh my god, like, what are we going to do? Right? You can fast later on and make up for all the food that you ate. It's OK. That's how you did it. You feasted, and then you fasted. That's the natural cycle. And really, the conclusions are very simple. Like, I hate when we overcomplicate things. When you're eating, you're going to store calories, right? Insulin goes up, tells your body, calories are coming in, energy's coming in. 
you need to store some of this because if you don't, you'll die, right? If you have no ability to store calories, the, you, know, you will die in your sleep because you have no energy. So that's what we do, we store calories. When you don't eat, you burn that calories. That's all it is. So fasting simply allows your body to use the stores of energy, and that's all you're talking about. If you have excess glucose, which is a source of energy, then this intervention could be very good for you. In fact, it could save your life. Thank you.